Welcome back to Nothing But Net Income, where valuations are the end game. I'm your host, Adam. We're going to be talking about Teladoc today. T-D-O-C is the ticker, and this stock is one that we're going to jump right into. I'm going to get into the background of what this company does. They are a virtual whole-person care ecosystem. It includes, you know, on your phone, in the hospital, wherever you might be getting health care. They really tout it being a customer-first, very integrated highly like technology driven platform and because uh, they use a lot of technology and artificial intelligence and that kind of stuff they actually save customers and insurance companies a lot of money you see they save between 19 and 121 dollars per visit depending on the specialty where you are a lot of different factors but they do you know virtual whole person care from everything from better help which is their mental health segment this includes you know booking a counselor that you can see over your phone so you don't actually physically go to a location Lovongo which is their chronic care consistent monitoring so that they have systems for those who have diabetes hypertension you know these systems that uh, are maybe a little bit more complex that your doctor would want to know a little bit more about in touch health it's this is how they basically have the ambulance talking to the hospital talking to the primary care talking to the er like this is basically a system in which all the doctor's offices and all of the medical facilities can talk to each other and have the same uh, the same information on the patient and that kind of thing. They own even more than that, but these are just some of the acquisitions they've made. So they've got a lot of different things, but we all know that during the pandemic, this was the the stock, if not like between it and Zoom and maybe a couple others, this was a darling that's now soured a couple of years later. It's actually lower today uh, than it was at its IPO price of $28. So this goes to show you you definitely can overpay for growth stocks and you can overpay for growth like you think this stock was just going to keep exploding higher after the pandemic but uh, our world kind of slowly got back to normal and this was a mistake that i made because i actually started buying the first shares of teledoc after they announced the acquisition of lavongo i thought it was a great acquisition at the time um Though I still think it's a good company that they acquired to make themselves the the clear first mover and the leader in virtual whole person care, they definitely overpaid uh, $18.5 billion, and now their market cap is just under $4 billion for the whole company. So um, we'll talk more about this, but I definitely think um, it, it was an interesting move, but they overpaid for sure for Livongo. Um, th- you know, this is a company that... After the lockdowns, people realized it was like it was an important thing, but then reality set back in, and you see we started coming back down to earth. Gravity set in, we had interest rates start going up, so growth stocks went out of fashion, yada, yada, yada. A lot of things happened, and I was averaging down basically this whole way. So my average price is now closer to 57. It's not still up in the 160s <laughs> range or even higher so my cost basis is a lot lower because i've been buying a lot more shares in specifically this 25 to 30 dollar range and that just goes to show you that stocks do come in and out of fashion we'll go into a few more risks as well teledoc is not the only player in virtual whole person healthcare. you got companies even like cvs they're trying to start their their minute clinics to give you the one-stop shop see a doctor get your medication same place same time alive core which has the cardio mobile type of units and even good rx they're getting more into the the whole person care not just one aspect of healthcare like uh your prescription or whatever it might be so that's one risk is it they're not the only player in the space there's always people who don't want to be in the pharma space and healthcare companies just they have higher legal costs they're in more legal battles especially uh, when you're talking with the government doesn't like when any big pharma company gets too big or when any player in medicine gets too dominant. So it's just a, a little risk when when a company does get larger in the space. The, uh, the main risk, and I think you'll see this throughout the video, is that the company Teladoc is still unprofitable on the bottom line. The revenues might not be exploding like they were out of the pandemic, though they are still growing. All the revenues 
are increasing. It's just they might not be growing at that breakneck pandemic pace. Uh, and the other risk we wanted to highlight is they are diluting shareholders. In the past two years, they've gone from 150 million shares to 162 million shares, and it was even even more um, before that, to be honest. I, I do think uh, this isn't the worst thing that they did, especially in 2020 when their share price was inflated. I'm happy they were selling shares because this is good way that they made sure they weren't going to go bankrupt by securing a little bit more cash when their stock price was elevated. It is important to know also that they are not alone in the you know telehealth space, but they're really the only ones doing everything. They're the only ones doing mental health, the chronic care, the, the setting up the actual physical uh, appointment with your doctor, physician, PA, whoever it is. And I do think they overpaid for Livongo, $18.5 billion, and now the company is worth $4 billion. This, this has largely passed now. It's been baked into the stock price. It was one of the reasons they got, they got pummeled and just punished so bad. Uh, but I do think this is all really much in the rear view at this point. You'll see why in a couple slides uh, that they've baked it all into what's called goodwill impairments. And like I said, it's all should be in the rear view at this point. Um, and this is a chart that shows kind of that super hard hit to profitability because of this goodwill impairments. You'll see in 2022 and 2023 was the worst of it. They, they lost a lot of money. They lost $3.1 in Q2 of last year. They only lost $65 million in Q2 of this year. So those losses are dramatically narrowing. Um, and because, like I said, it's in the rear view, they, they have these goodwill par impairments baked into their last few quarters of reports. You could see losses of insane amounts, like dollars per share of just losses that go straight to the fact that they way overpaid um, and are writing down that loss uh, in Livongo. And uh, I do, I, th I think that that's why you see such an ugly chart there. It, they're feeling the amortization of intangibles, which basically means writing down debt and loans. Um, and you, you're seeing that that was such a big hit to the bottom line. But you see those goodwill intangible asset payments, uh, they were large in December of 2020, all the way until the following year, the summertime, they started going down. And now we're into the summertime of 2023, a year later, and they're pretty much flat again, back to where they were before they started taking those big losses on the Livongo acquisition. So like I said, it should be behind us at this point. It's baked into the stock. It's made them, you know, punished in the short term, but long term, I think we're now in the clear. Analysts do expect them, you see, to close this gap uh, here. This is from Simply Wall Street. Uh, close the gap of profitability into 2024 and 2025. So the losses are narrowing. The goodwill impairments should stop. I don't think they're making any other purchases anytime soon. I think leadership has f identified the mistakes that they made. So uh, with that, we'll go into their la latest earnings report, which was just a couple weeks back as of recording this video. So the revenues are up 10% year over year, which is good. We want to keep seeing revenues increase. They're not going up 20, 30, 40% like they were post pandemic, but uh, here we are still years later and they're still growing revenues. And this is, this is awesome because we want to see revenue growth in our valuations. And we'll show you that at the very end of this video, adjusted gross margins are still increasing and actually record gross margins, meaning 70.8%, most of the money is going to pay overhead and operating costs. So this is this is really good to see. We want to see a company that can execute very well, very profitably in the future. If they're not bottom line profitable now, they're, they have the foundation, the building blocks to get there very soon. Uh, better help revenues, the, this is the mental health segment, they're up 17%, so almost double what the, the full company is at. So this is a, a great bright spot in the company. They're, they're growing faster than the rest of the company, and this shows that that was a great acquisition. Livongo still grows pretty well, and, and when they bought the company, Livongo itself was profitable, so it should be a, a 
gain in the future. If there is, you know, restructuring costs when you buy a business that might hurt the profitability in the short term, Lavongo's profitability should come back and really help the bottom line soon here as well, especially now better help uh, exploding as it is as well uh, should all help uh, future years. So this is all good news. You want to see the integrated care revenue, which is their main business, maybe up a little higher than it's at. It's only up 5% year over year. We want to see it growing, which we are seeing. Telemedicine uh, compound annual growth rate is expected to be 24% until the end of this decade. And this is a huge number. I wanted you, if you take nothing else home after this video, know that telemedicine's not going anywhere. Telemedicine is here to stay and it's going to be growing, especially through the end of this decade. I'm betting on the, the leader in the space, which is Teladoc. And with all their purchases, they've solidified their lead in telemedicine. No one's going to catch them by 2030. I can almost guarantee that they are going to be the leader in telemedicine unless some some huge misstep by management happens where they make another really expensive acquisition or take out some bad loans or whatever it is. But they're in the driver's seat and it's their game to lose, really. And other financial highlights from the latest quarterly reports, international revenue just starting here. The U.S. is up 521 to 562 million, and that's over the last year. But international revenues up even more on a percentage basis, up 20 million dollars in the past year, uh, from just 71 million to 91 million. So we want to see more international growth, especially in some of the markets that maybe have a little less exposure to healthcare, just to, because this is a product that's affordable for people and and helping people receive more healthcare in the world. So this is a good thing too. And nearly $1 billion in cash and cash equivalents on their balance sheet, $959 million to be exact, at the end of quarter two. And they only have $400 million in current liabilities. So they're not going bankrupt anytime soon. They could literally pay off all their current debt right now with the cash that they have in hand and still have over half of a billion dollars on their balance sheet. So they're not going bankrupt. They might have to sell a little bit more shares. I hope they don't. Um, they might have to take out a little bit more debt. I hope they don't in a high interest rate environment. But their cash position makes me feel very good because they sold shares when the stock price was high, which is why I don't mind the dilution when that price was inflated. Now we're going to go into the valuation part of this video. So why would I choose EBITDA over net income for valuing Teladoc right now? Well, so EBITDA is important to look at, especially when you're looking at a company that's not quite reached its profitability. And because uh, the numbers are kind of messy right now with Teladoc, that's not that's not uh, something I want to hide. I want to be very transparent. The acquisitions and even uh, things like stock-based compensation makes this kind of messy. And Teladoc is not the the cleanest of companies to just like analyze and tell you, oh, this is what they're going to be making. This is what they're going to be bringing to the bottom line in five years because you just can't do that at this point. So we're going to be looking at what's called EBITDA, an adjusted EBITDA, earnings before interest taxation, depreciation, amortization. And it's ideal here because you're, you're taking out the one-time expense noise, anything like those goodwill impairments, stock-based compensation. And that's why we're looking at that today. Uh, and we're using adjusted EBITDA because it takes out those irregular one-time items. And, and it does account for a fair share of what Teladoc is sees on their quarterly reports, annual reports, uh, because the company's just at this at this stage where they've made some mistakes and there's some growing pains. And, and like I said, a lot of it's behind us at this point, but it makes the numbers that we have hard to make future predictions based off of. So let's look now into what they are telling us is going to be their outlook for at least the rest of this year. We're not going to look at the quarter numbers because with writing down a huge loss like the 18.5 billion of Lavongo, they can they can fudge that goodwill impairment number from quarter to quarter to make it they pay a little bit more here, a little less there, a little so look at the year number for now. Adjusted EBITDA is exploding, up 22 to 32% potentially for the full year. This is awesome to see. Adjusted EBITDA is showing basically the closest thing we have to operating day-to-day -day profitability when you take out all those one-time expenses. So this is what we want to see. The actual core business moving forward, this is the kind of growth that we're going to expect. We do see also that revenues are still trending up 
post-pandemic, we're seeing that they're predicting this year 8 to 11% year-over-year growth. And in a telemedicine industry that's supposed to grow 24%, I think this is a little bit on the low side, personally. Now let's look at some of the other companies maybe in the space. And this is the hardest part of the video for me because uh, they're, cause the numbers are messy. Like I said, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat that. So we're looking at a trailing 12-month adjusted EBITDA. So that means in the last year, Teladoc had $42.4 million off of their revenue of $2.41 billion. So... This is, like I said, we're looking at adjusted EBITDA because that's the closest thing we have to actual core business profitability at this point. And let's look at the adjusted EBITDA then of companies like DocuSign, which was another pandemic darling, if you will, uh, Datadog, Zoom. These are all companies that are in the software as a service space, which is what Teladoc is selling. Is They're selling software and they're selling, you know, they're selling a product suite, which is a lot like some of these other companies. So DocuSign, very close to what Teladoc was making in adjusted EBITDA for the last 12 months. And then off of about the approximately the same amount of revenue, Datadog, a little bit lower in adjusted EBITDA off of a little bit lower in revenue and Zoom a little bit higher and a little bit higher. So we're looking at DocuSign, a company that's closest to where Teladoc currently is, Datadog, probably where Teladoc was about two years ago. I would uh, I would look back at the numbers and it was about two years ago. These were similar numbers. And then Zoom. This is a company that I think that Teladoc could grow to in the next three, four years, about the size of Zoom. Some of these numbers, you know, it's not an exact science. It's more of an art form. Like I said, the numbers aren't cut and dry. They're not super clear here. Even if you look at the price to sales of some of these companies. So the price to sales of Teladoc is 1.55 as of the recording of this video, DocuSign at a 3.86, Datadog at a 15.03, Zoom at a 4.57. Now, I don't think a price to sales of like three for Teladoc is completely out of the question, but we're going to go with about a 2.5. I want to look at also a company in the, in the healthcare space that's also got a software product suite, if you will. I think the GoodRx company is a good comparison for them in that regard. They got an adjusted EBITDA of $65 million on $795.7 million in revenue, and they have a 7.17% operating margin. So they're a little bit smaller in terms of the, the amount of revenue they bring in, but they do it more profitably. So this is kind of like the goal that Teladoc should be working towards is getting like an operating margin in the high single digits would be excellent. And that's because it shows you the market has rewarded them with a much higher price to sales ratio, which is at 4.38. So like I said, I don't think three of a sales ratio is totally out of the question in the future, but we're going to look at a price to sales for now of 2.5 would be, I, I would say would be fairly valued because that's still far lower than DocuSign, far lower than a good RX, which is the best current comp if uh, they were getting to that profitability in the next few years. So a very conservative, in my opinion, 2.5 price to sales is what we're going to be running these numbers off of. So the current market cap is $3.97 billion for Teladoc. And at a 2.5 today, with the revenues of 2.41 billion brought in in the last 12 months, the market cap, in my opinion, should be much closer to like a six billion dollar valuation, which would be over 50 percent higher than the current stock price that Teladoc is at today. And if they're growing eight percent every year, which is their you know estimated forward guidance on the low end, they said eight to 11 percent. I think at a in a industry that's supposed to grow 24 to 30 percent compound annual growth for the next eight years until the end of the decade, eight percent is extremely conservative. I think they'll blow these numbers out of the water. But at a 2.5 price to sales, which would I think, especially by 2028, would the market would see maybe this management team has cleaned up its act a bit. It hasn't been buying companies at extreme valuations. They've been delivering on their numbers. Then we can reward them with a 2.5, which isn't even a reward really in my opinion, because they've just been punished at a 1.55 price to sales. 
So anyways, if we run these numbers, you see, you can look at all the charts down there. By 2024, they could be anywhere to the $6.5 billion market capitalization range, all the way to 2028, all up to the $8.8 billion market cap range, anywhere from a 63, 64% upside in 2024 from current values, all the way up to over 123% upside from the current valuations, if that 8% revenue growth does hold and the market treats them with a 2.5 price to sales, which by then we we should be looking at a price to earnings because the profits should be should be there by then. So you could value them not on a revenue standpoint, but on an earnings standpoint. But this is the best I can do right now. I know, like I said, it's an art form, not a science, especially with these unprofitable companies. But um, in a in a market leader in the telehealth space, I think these numbers are very conservative. I don't think these are completely out of the question. I think that the market has decided Teladoc hasn't performed. They've made some rash decisions. We are not going to buy them until they've proven themselves. So that's where you could hop in this stock now and beat some of the Wall Street money, some of the bigger money to the punch. Very low risk that they're going to go bankrupt with the cash that they have. But you saying you're taking uh, a look at them before, before other people have rewarded them. And that's where you could see these lopsided upside potential into the future. So I hope you like this video little bit more in depth on the valuation there because again it was a little bit more abstract if you like this style please let me know that down below in the comments if there's any other stocks that you want me to analyze let me know down there in the comments and uh, thanks for watching sticking to the end of the video like subscribe all that fun stuff signing off